Hi everyone, Alex from Sparkman Engineering here, and this week I'm with Kelly, a speech language pathologist here at one of the local schools in Colorado. Kelly, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. So for those that might not be aware, can you explain a little bit about what you do and the types of challenges your students encounter? Sure. As a speech language pathologist, one of my main goals is to work with my students to help them improve their communication. So I have a lot of students who use assistive technology to help them access the school environment and also the world around them. I also have some students who, for different reasons, can't use their mouth to speak like you and I do. So they use what we call Alternative and Augmentative Communication, or AAC. And AAC looks different for different people based on what their needs are. But for my students, typically they use a tablet in combination with an application and then they can select their message on the app and the tablet will speak it for them. So when you mention AAC, I instantly think of Stephen Hawking, who has not only uh, challenges with communication, but physical as well. Do a lot of your students face similar challenges when trying to interface with, trying to interact with their AAC device? They do. Some of my students have difficulty with gross motor and or fine motor function, and so that can make it difficult for them to reach out and touch a specific icon on a screen, and sometimes it's even difficult for them to press down on a button. So what we do is we use assistive technology to help them, and it works with their device, and you can set that up through the accessibility options on your tablet. So I know that here, especially in the U.S., medical equipment is notoriously expensive. Has that limited your access to certain types of assistive technology in the classroom? It has. In education, sometimes we don't have the resources to purchase expensive adaptive equipment. And insurance companies a lot of times don't want to pay for something that the student hasn't trialed with their device so that they know that it works. So a simple switch with an audio cable can cost around $60 and a more complex switch, like a proximity switch, can cost around $200. Wow. Yeah, so that's why I was so excited for this opportunity to work with you on this project. I think it's really important that we as educators collaborate with the maker community, as well as our STEM programs and robotics clubs, and use them as a resource. Um, and by doing so, we can create exciting new learning opportunities for our students, and we can also get them involved in helping other people in their community. I think that's a great idea. Do you have a specific project in mind that you'd like to work on? I do. The student that I have in mind um, has difficulty with her fine motor function and she also doesn't have the muscle strength to be able to press down on a button. So I'd like to make a proximity switch. And a proximity switch is something that doesn't require actual physical contact. It is activated by something being around the area of the switch. So basically, my student will be able to hold her hand over the switch without actually touching it, and that will activate the switch. I think that sounds like a great idea and definitely something that should cost less than $200. Great. One of the first things I looked at with this project was how the AAC device interacted with the tablet. I found that most of the AAC switches use a three and a half millimeter audio cable. I first tried connecting a switch between the ground sleeve of the cable and the mic input, as well as the left and right speaker outputs, but I wasn't able to get a tablet to recognize the switch was being pressed. I did see a note though that mentioned that the external switch could be from a Bluetooth connection, however. I next tried setting up our RN41 Bluetooth radio as an HID keyboard. The idea was that if I can connect the tablet to the Bluetooth keyboard, I can send characters over serial to the radio and the tablet will then see a key has been pressed and act accordingly to the action that was defined when the switch was set up. I then paired the RN41 to the tablet and set everything up in the accessibility menu by activating the switches one at a time. Now that I have a way to interact with the tablet and I have a push button switch as one input, I worked on the proximity sensor. I started off looking at our sensors we currently sell ultrasonic, IR line follower, and our ZX gesture sensor. The main things I was looking for was cost and functionality. The line follower was by far the cheapest, but there wasn't much of a working distance, only a couple of centimeters. The other major downside was I was afraid that in direct sunlight, the IR sensor would give a false trigger. So I wanted to make that a little more robust as well. The ultrasonic sensor gives me a larger sensing distance 
but still felt like overkill because this particular sensor can measure up to six and a half meters. While the ZX gesture sensor allowed me to create multiple switches with a single sensor, having to remember multiple gestures just overcomplicated things. In the end, what I settled on was a TV IR receiver, which requires a 38 kilohertz infrared signal. So to drive the IR LED, I used a simple 555 timer to generate the 38 kilohertz, along with the transistor to switch the IR LED on and off. Adding a Schmidt trigger on the output of the receiver made the circuit a bit more robust against triggering multiple times when a hand is placed right on the edge of the sensing distance. On a tablet, under accessibility options, it allows you to change the way you interact with your device. For example, if you turn on switch control, you can connect a switch to the device and the device will scan each icon on the screen by outlining or highlighting the icon. There are different options for scanning style. One is auto scanning, which moves the selector across the screen and will stop when the switch is activated. Another is manual scanning, which requires the switch to be engaged each time it moves to a different item and a second switch to activate the item. So the interface could be as simple as a single switch or a joystick that is activated with their hand, foot, mouth, or head. But it could also be more complex with a proximity sensor or an eye gaze system that tracks their eye movement in order to interact with their AAC device. I like this. So in the end, how much did this cost? Well, I was able to find a four pack of these answer buttons on Amazon for around $10. The most expensive part was definitely the Bluetooth device that was around $50 but the $200 proximity sensor I was able to make for around $10. That's awesome. This is definitely an affordable project that I'll be able to use with my students. And with the school year starting, if you're looking for projects to use with your students, or if you're active in your local hacker or makerspace community, this is a great community outreach project that can help someone who uses AAC. Kelly, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for all your help and thanks for having me. Of course.